Victor, at the end of the day, physicists, philosophers, even theologians, point to the existence of physical law as perhaps the most fundamental thing that they can deal with. How do you define law? The laws of, of physics are not handed down from above like the Ten Commandments. I know it's a common belief that the laws of physics must have come from uh, either God or are built into the structure of the universe. But in fact, the laws of physics are human inventions. They're in inventions of, of physicists. They're mathematical descriptions of, of phenomena that, uh, that, that we observe. And uh, they uh, are the way they are. Most of them are the way they are because they can't be any other way. And, and that's, uh, I think, what a lot of people don't realize. Uh, around 1916, there was a, a mathematician named Emmy Noether uh, who, who proved a remarkable theorem. And her theorem was that if you had any, any mathematical theory in which uh, uh, you did not select out any special moment in time, uh, and didn't select out any position, uh, any particular position in space or direction in space, then that theory automatically had built into it the laws of conservation of energy, of linear momentum, and angular momentum. These are probably the three most important universal laws of physics. And they're not constraints, in other words, on, on the behavior of matter. They're constraints on physicists. If physicists are going to write their laws down in, in a way that doesn't depend on any particular point of view, this is the way I describe it, I call it point of view invariance, uh, if you're going to try to write objective laws down, then you have to, those laws cannot depend on any particular point of view, those mathematical descriptions that you're coming up with uh, 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 can't depend on that point of view. Now, of course, they still have to agree with the data. I'm not saying, I'm not talking uh, about the laws being arbitrary. They, they still have to, well, the mathematical models is probably a better way to describe this. The so you don't like models. the word law at all? No, I don't like the word law particularly, but uh, it's, it's a convention, so we, we, have, to, we have to still <laughs> use it. So uh, it would be uh, better, however, to, uh, to think of it more as, as just uh, a model. that we These are a series of models that we, that we write down. Now... Uh, so the, this was a discovery that was made early in the 20th century, and uh, uh, people built on that. For example, Einstein built upon this, and if you go back, although he didn't derive his special theory of relativity quite this way, if you go back and you extend these invariance principles, these symmetry principles they're sometimes called, uh, to four-dimensional space Time, so you not, you not only have position in in space and position in time, but you also have direction in time. You have a rotational invariance in four dimensional space. That when you write the equations down to have that particular characteristic, then special relativity falls out. The the so called Lorentz transformation and so on falls out. So that's again a law that follows from just a simple requirement that we can't write things down in, in a way that, that depends on a on a point a particular point of view. So, so what then differentiates what you are saying from the way most physicists then use the word law? Well, I think physicists recognize these symmetry principles, uh, but still sort of think of them as as being built into the structure of the universe. And you might say, in a way, it is. It, it, what the universe is is objective. It's not something that depends on uh, on our individual uh, way of looking at things. It's independent of humans. Let, let me see uh, if I, 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 I understand this. What we're saying is that there are certain basic principles that, that are this invariance that would be true in any possible universe, all possible worlds, it would have to be that way? It would have to be that way. This is kind of interesting. It would have to be that way if there's no God. 
there's nobody out there or any other force out there uh, selecting over. out yeah. uh, a particular point of view. And and uh, since since that's a reasonable assumption, you make that assumption, and wow, it agrees with the data. So the laws of physics not only don't look uh, like they they uh, well, the laws of physics not only did not do not seem to come from God, they seem to look just like they would expect it to look if they didn't come from any kind of external uh, a force, including some you know, some non personal uh, super. Power out there that no one understands or has any any a way of uh, of proving or disproving. So these fundamental principles are built into the, just the structure of reality. I mean, it can't be any possible way. But then the 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 mathematical formula that, that describes specific laws like. Uh, Gravitation, whether Newtonian or Einsteinian, are derived from that, well, or they could be they could be different. I mean, it could have been instead of the uh, inverse square law in terms of gravity, it could be an inverse cube law. Is that possible? Well, yeah. Except there's there's more to the story than that, and that is the the mathematical models that we build are based on on certain quanti- have certain quantities in them, and these quantities are quantities that we've defined in terms of how we measure them. Measure them. And so time is defined by what you measure on a clock. And position is, is measured with a meter stick. In fact, every, ultimately everything goes down to measurements with, uh, with clocks. Because uh, today distance is also defined as the time it takes to go a, a, a certain distance. So you have uh, the fact that uh, not only are these mathematical models human invention, so are the terms that goes, go into these models. And is there an absolute time behind all of this? Well, there's something out there that time that our that our time measured on a clock is, is is reading, but I don't know what it is, and nobody knows what it is because metaphysical questions are not answerable by the methods of science. If they were, then they would be science, and there would be physics, and, and not metaphysics. And uh, and so, what happened in the 20th century was was uh, physicists realized that. Uh, this was a, a rather grand principle. They didn't call it point of view invariance. That's my own particular designation. And, but they discovered that uh, uh, if you apply the principle not only to space and time, but to the abstract spaces in which you make make you know, describe things in quantum mechanics and so on, there's this abstract space called Hilbert space, and you, and in that Hilbert space is a is a Abstract thing called the state vector that determines the the uh, the state of the system. It'd be very much like in economics, for example, if you had a you had a a space of of uh, uh, supply and demand, and then you had a uh, a vector pointing. You had a, you can imagine the graph of supply versus demand on the vector pointing to to uh, some particular state, economic state. That's an abstract representation of an economic system. Well, the same thing goes on in, in physics. We make these abstract representations. And then you say, it can't depend on that rotation of that axis. You can rotate the axis, and, and the vector stays the same. That's, again, an invariance principle. It's a symmetry principle that says uh, that however I use the state vector, I can't, I can't uh, use it in such a way that singles out one particular point of view. So what follows from that? That's called, that principle is called gauge invariance. When you apply gauge invariance, all kinds of wonderful things happen. For example, you show that uh, your conservation of charge follows, electric charge. And, and not only that, when you apply it uh, locally, so that, which means that the, the gauge principle has to be applied at every point in space-time, you get the equations of electromagnetism. Well, they just it, fall out. It sounds then that this principle is very fundamental, and yeah. why aren't we calling it a law? You know, the electric field, for example, is is, and the magnetic field, are are things that you introduce to preserve gauge invariance. When you write down the equations, the normal way, you find they're not gauge invariant, and so you put in these fields, they're fictitious. You have to put them in so that you have this. Uh, gauge invariance, and that same principle was then applied uh, as when as time went on to the development of the what's now called the standard 
model of particles and fields came out around 1970 and has remained in in, in, in agreement with all the data ever since. So let's, let, let, let's take a step back and see where we are. We have the universe sitting here, and there are no laws that we physicists traditionally think about it, but just ways that physicists infer from the whole universe what's happening. Now you say there are certain fundamental principles which then the laws are derived from. So we have all this stuff in the middle, elect the standard model of particle physics, electromagnetism, all those kinds of things that people call laws that you're not calling laws. You're mm -hmm. calling these models because they're modeling the universe, mm -hmm. but they themselves are based upon some invariant principles. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? And that principle is, is simply point of view invariance. You can't they can't. They they have to write the 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 their equations down, in 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 order to describe the universe objectively. So all they're really telling us about the universe is is that it's objective. Uh, that it's not all in our heads. In other words, do physicists make mistakes by trying to assume that what they are working with are are, are fundamental laws? No, I don't think they do because. Uh, in fact, most physicists wouldn't even be engaged in a discussion like this because as far as they're concerned, you have your models and you make your, your measurements. You look at the data. If it agrees with the data, then they're happy. If it doesn't agree with the data, then they're happy too because it gives them something to do and maybe maybe do some more experiments to try to... Uh, and how about uh, theologians who would ultimately point to the laws of nature as being the ultimate demonstration that... Uh, that, that there's uh, design in the universe. Right. Well, that's, that's one of the arguments that you hear all the time. If you, you, if you go through all of the various claims of scientific evidence for God and you find that they fail, which they do, then people will still say, well, what about the laws? Well, for example, let me step back. Uh, when you uh, uh, talk about, for example, the origin of the universe, and you show that the origin of the universe did not violate any known laws of physics. I still like to use the word laws in that sense because that's the common use of the term. That people will say, well, then where did those laws come from? So now I provide them with this explanation. I think that it's, but what, and uh, I haven't really invented it. As I said, this is what uh, I'm just describing and interpreting the, the physics of the 20th century which uh, uh, came to this realization that behind it all were a very simple set of symmetry principles that uh, uh, you'd expect to have in a universe that came from nothing. If you ask me where the laws of physics come from, they came from nothing. If the, if the universe didn't come from nothing, if it had some shape to begin with, then uh, the, these laws might be violated.